Um, I'm here to introduce Michal Prokop. He's going to talk about state of Debian based Linux live systems in 2010. So, welcome. Hi, thanks for visiting my talk. I'll give a bro brief overview from the upper part of the Debian system into the city of, of live systems. Um, just a bit about myself. I'm Debian developer, project lead of Grimmel, GRML, a uh, Debian-based live system for system administrators. I'm maintaining uh, all the lower parts for booting stuff, and I'd like to know which people of you already use Debian Live. Okay. Um, how many of you don't know what's Debian Live yet? Just two or three people. Oh, great. Um, where are we flying to? I'd like to start with um, the, my motivation about this talk at all. We have 50% of all the existing live systems are based on Debian, which is a pretty good count, and more than 70% of them provide a live system or even provide just a live system and no hard disk installation overall. I think live systems are pretty important um, nowadays because users want to test live systems on their hardware, how well does the hardware support work, is, are there any problems they want to test be before installing them? And I sh think we should um, think more about distributing a live system as a base for each release of us. I'll talk about this later. So some bits about the history of live systems. Um, back in the early days of live systems, whereas this is something like f five to ten years ago, the main problems of live systems were hardware recognition. Which drivers are present? What modules do you have to load? What when you want to hot plug a device? Nowadays we have UDEV and the kernel and they do pretty much all the stuff we need. And um, live system developers can concentrate on all the stuff that's really important for the live system itself. So the live system build stuff, the software selection, um, special mechanism for all the inner parts of it. But too many options to choose from. Um, at each single step um, built within the live system, there are many options you might choose from, but just a few of them really work. So I'll start with the bootloaders. We have two. The first one is Grub. I think no, all of you know um, this bootloader for your hard disk installations. Um, the nice thing about Grub is that it supports several file systems. And the ESO loopback feature is great. I'll um, show it later on. But it lacks proper documentation. Um, the documentation is distributed all around the web. Um, there is some more recent um, documentation. There's auto outdated documentation, invalid documentation. And in within the project, the uh, documentation is distributed within a wiki. And sadly, no relevant distribution uses it for CD boot yet. As far as I know, Ubuntu plans to um, use Scrub for their next release as default for the live system. And I think that's um, something um, you should be aware of if you're building a live system using Grub as a bootloader. Um, there might be issues um, that aren't um, known to developers or you um, yet. Then we have the ESO Linux and Sys Linux suite, um, which is rocking solid. Um, I've had no real issues um, um, developing uh, the live system with it for the last six years. And uh, the upstream is very cooperative. So we have, if you have any issues, um, you will get debug uh, versions and help resolving this issue. But just limited file system support. So you don't get all the features you might get from Grub. And the graphical boot isn't fun. So if you ever saw the very graphical menus from the larger distributions, that's a highly customized um, ESO Linux uh, version, which is absolutely no fun to remaster or to adjust to your needs. The ESO Linux stuff is for booting the CD, so ISO 9660 file systems, whereas the Sys Linux part is um, responsible for booting USB devices um, with a FAT um, file system. 
ways to boot the live system. Um, the most common ones are Pixie boot, USB boot, and of course CD and uh, DVD. I was talking about this ESO feature, and um, it's a nice method to integrate live systems into hard disk installations. This is an example for uh, GRUB2. So we just create a menu entry, call the loopback command, assign it um, to an ISO, which uh, you can later on use in the kernel and the initRD options. So you don't have to extract anything from the ISO, but instead you can select the kernel, you can select the initRD, and pro um, provide according boot options. Um, find ESO is just relevant to search all the devices for the recording ESO um, file. Boot is live is the stuff that's being used in Debian Live um, in all the tools and just further command lines you might want to, to use. I've documented this in my blog if you're interested um, to try it out on your own. But it's a very decent and, and nice way to get a live system as long as you have a working hard disk installation. So as long as your uh, boot manager works, you can just change root into a rescue system without having to plug in a USB device or CD or um, set up Pixie boot. Now, um, about the tool chain that, that's involved in, in the um, live system. Um, we want to distribute much more software than would fit on a usual CD. So 700 megabyte won't that be that much if you want all the browser and documenting stuff and the several editors. So you might want to compress them. There are several options available. Um, the one that came from Knopix, um, a very prominent uh, popular live system was C-Loop, which is out of tree. So you don't get um, C-Loop um, um, integrated um, without using the stuff from, from Knopix. GrammFS is pretty outdated and no relevant uh, live system uses it anymore. And the most recent one and the most successful one is SquashFS. Um, SquashFS uh, went mainline, so it's available within the mainline kernel. And um, there's coming a new version, SquashFS LZMA, which does just a better uh, compression, about 8 to 10 percent according to my benchmarks. Um, sadly, it's not yet in mainline, so you have to patch your kernel and your user space tools to get such compression. But I think it's worth the effort because you can just distribute 100, 200 megabyte more. Colin? I can. Uh, hi, Colin, CJ Watson. Um, do you know what the state of LZMA is? this on? Okay. Uh, do you know what the state of LZMA regarding? Uh, actually getting into the kernel is. Uh, the, last, the last time I heard, uh, it was quite difficult because the kernel guys didn't want to have multiple compression methods built into the kernel. Um, well, LZMA is available itself in the kernel, and um, uh, Philip has just to clean up the, his batch. So it was, um, or I hoped it would reach the 260, 2635 kernel, but um, I don't think it will reach before 36 or 37, but I'm pretty sh pretty sure it it will reach the kernel because he's um, he has just to clean up and state that yeah, well it's just a work that needs to be done. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, then for the other part, we have um, UnionFS, um, which is a method to provide a live system that looks like a hard disk installation. The problem of live systems is that on a CD you can't write just stuff. You need a method to overlay all the writing stuff and the first great innovation was UnionFS, which is kernel based um, but used to then uh, pretty unstable. UnionFS FUSE is the user space implementation I never really uh, try to use because it has some performance issues and it's not that um, common yet. Um, another UnionFS is a rewrite of UnionFS by a guy from Japan, which did a pretty good job, but sadly it's not yet part of a mainline kernel. There's a new version available, which is known as another UnionFS version 2, 
which works as well, but it's sadly not yet in the mainline kernel. Um, for booting a live system, you need a support in your initRD to search for the according live system itself. So the root file system we were creating with the SquashFS tools need to be found by the initRD. And you have uh, uh, initRD generators nowadays, init RAMFS tools, Raycut, and yet another MCAR initRD. Um, the last one is pretty uncommon and um, not that um, much used and not widely used. Raycut um, is coming, I think, from the Red Hat um, guys. And init RAMFS tools and Raycut share quite a large amount of code. And we are um, working together to fix the problems in all the initRD stuff. So on Debian, you might use or should use init RAMFS tools. And Dreecut uh, might be an option for you in, in some months. For the live boot stuff itself, you need um, all the scripts that find the live system. And you might have heard about live init RAMFS. That's the counterpart to init RAMFS tools. And live boot is the successor of it. So it's a rewrite uh, the Debian live project is working on. And currently, you can just replace live init RAMFS with the live boot stuff. And the rewrite will bring up new features and um, um, cool stuff. Um, Casper is the, um, the code which um, is used in Ubuntu. And that's the one live init RAMFS is based on. So as far as I know, um, Ubuntu, um, Colin, please, please correct me if I'm not right, um, wants to share code with, with Debian Live and wants to merge code as. Yeah, OK. OK, great. Um, and we have the tool chain for booting itself, but we have to create, of course, the live system. And we have several boot build systems where I want to present two. My own one is known as Grimmel Live. Um, to get a live system is just easy as calling this. You specify the, the Debian suite, the architecture, and Grimmel Base is a base class which does all the fancy live system stuff for you. You choose a specific uh, flavor. You can, of course, use your own one. And the architecture uh, wants more to get a according um, kernel version. But being on DebConf, I want to um, uh, promote Debian Live. Um, just a few words um, for Grimmel Live. It's based on Phi, and that's something which is very nice because um, Phi is a full automated installation tool and provides a very nice approach, the class based um, approach. We can just provide scripts in a class named foo um, with a script name or just place a file that should be it, um, etc foo rc and use the class name. And you can just use a base class and pull all your stuff for all the different live systems you want to build based on base classes or further classes. So the class-based approach is very nice to um, either install Debian, of course, with using Phi, or to provide um, um, further scripts uh, for the live system. The live build of Debian Live is as simple um, as in Grimmel Live. It's you just call LH config. It creates a config tree. You can just adjust uh, the config uh, configuration bootstrap where you might want to specify the mirror which is faster than the German one and then call it with root permissions to build the ESO itself. Um, if you want to build uh, the live system using Debian Live with the Debian installer included. Um, Daniel and several others, other guys from, from the live system um, just worked on the live system part of the Debian installer. And uh, as far as I know, it works well during DebConf. Um, so all you have to do to include the installer is call lhconfig with the according options. There's live helper in, in, as a web front end available. 
where you can just um, provide a few essential details, um, adjust the options according to your needs, and the Live Helper web front end will build an ISO for you so you don't have to install it um, on your own system. Chris Lamp um, developed a very nice um, alternative to this approach. You might have heard about SUSE Studio, uh, which is a web front end um, with fancy features to create your live system. And nowadays we have um, studio.debian.net uh, where you can just um, register yourself and similar to the previous uh, one, you can just create your live system. Um, it was released during DebConf. So I, I created a, um, a rescue image and you get a build information and the according command line that was used for building the ESO. Now, a fancy feature of nowadays uh, live systems is the hybrid um, feature. Hybrid boot provides an option to use the same ISO image with hard disk installation like um, a grub bootloader as well as a live part. So you can just DD an ESO to your USB device and you can boot it then. No further fancy stuff needed. If you just want to be boot a live system from USB, all you have to do is call the ISO Linux um, hybrid um, binary, which is executed by default on Debian Live nowadays. And you can just take the, the file and DD it to your USB uh, device and it will boot, as well as the same ISO will boot from your CD. Um, very nice for nowadays live systems for building is the uh, CDN Debian Net um, mirror, which pr gives you not just the closest geographical location, but also it, it's known to be alive and it's up to date. So a very nice feature which you might consider for using building your live system so you don't have to adjust the mirror depending on where you are building or, or where you are traveling right now. Um, for splash, um, boot splash, um, graphical stuff, um, nowadays solution is the play mouse um, approach, which works pretty well. You have just to install it and use the splash boot option. And I'm pretty sure there might be more use of it um, as there were several tools available for this boot splash stuff. And nowadays um, this works pretty well, including the um, KMS stuff. So everything great, right? No. <laughs> we have a pretty nasty tool chain. Um, if you want to build your um, stuff with the LZMA compression, you have to patch your tools. The build system needs to support it. There were several op um, changes in command line options you might have to parse. Um, Several tools might break that are relevant for live boot and you might not be aware which tool it might be. So we have to deal with quite um, breakages during um, release cycle of, of live systems. And guess what? Uncooperative maintainers. You might consider a bug report. Um, there is a problem. I need to fix it but nobody cares about it or um, reacts in time, so you can just continue uh, building your stuff. But um, s luckily we can use the NMU um, uploads with the delayed queue. So nowadays we have a pretty good chance to fix all the stuff that's broken ourselves. And quality assurance. Sadly, um, live systems tend to move and we have um, several software packages on it. And if you are distributing more than 2,000 um, software packages like Grimmel does, you can't just test each package on your own. So I think we need some kind of quality assurance. We also lack like from hardware for not so common architecture. So we are good at the, the stuff users usually have at home, but there aren't that many live systems available for the not so common architectures. If you consider this worth an effort, um, you might be uh, interested in joining an existing team 
and show up with, with the hardware you have because the usual guys working on live systems just don't have the hardware pool that might be uh, useful for building live systems. But there are good news. We are DBN and we can fix our stuff and we have a pretty good um, tool chain in for re with regards to developers. And one I want to mention is the PureParts um, approach for um, checking the policy. And I'm building live systems on daily base and noticed um, much better packages as soon as PewParts showed up. So might, you might not be aware of this, this but installing packages and um, removing them and checking all this stuff um, was much improved as soon as PewParts showed up. So I think we should put more effort into this um, testing suite. Another good um, tool we have is Lintian because it pr provides the developer a, uh, uh, option to check his own packages without um, installing manually or just checking each single line in within the Debian directory. And uh, nowadays we even have rejects for very serious um, um, errors in the FTP master. So if you upload a package that very probably to break, um, Lintian on um, FTP masters will auto-reject it and Lintian improves our pool a lot. So um, what's interesting is that we can do daily builds with the live system. So you can just take the more most recent kernel, you can take the most recent user space tools from, from Unstable and provide your own um, daily builds. I'm aware of, of Ubuntu doing this. Um, in the Grimmer team, we are doing the same, and the live, uh, Debian Live team does the same. So what's interesting in, in this approach is that you can use continuous integration of your own so software. So you just upload a Debian package, and on the next day, you can just test how does it work together with all the other software packages which are not under your control, maybe and test them without having to update your own hardware installation or build uh, a virtual machine on your own. So you can just take the, the download the, the image and, and start testing. And for when talking about live systems, I don't want to leave you with all my, my complaints, but I propose some changes um, in, within Debian. Um, as a first step, I think we need auto-testing for the non German uh, speaking guys, auto is, is a car in, in German language. And um, as uh, developers or companies test their cars, I'd like to see the see same approach for uh, Debian. I'd like to crash in a controlled environment and not when the user gets our images and has to debug it on his own, which part is involved. Is, is it in a live special uh, tool? Is it in the common Debian stuff, or is it maybe in a Debian derivative uh, special stuff? So I'd like to crash it in a controlled environment. We can just test stuff, crash it, and know what, uh, what um, might to be fixed. And I'd like to verify it without any risks, because I don't want to install software on my productive servers or laptop or whatever, um, just to see whether it works. I'd like to test it without any risk, so I don't get X starting up again, and so on. Um, Grimmel started to, to work on a KVM test environment, where we can um, boot a system, inject a script that's being executed, and report back what's, what might be failed, or if it's okay. It was uh, mainly an, um, a prototype to see what's possible, and while working on it, I stumbled upon, with, together with another Grimmel developer, we stumbled upon um, Autotest, which is a fully automated um, testing suite um, controlled or mainly developed by Red Hat. And they are doing kernel-based tests, KVM-based tests, and several user space tools. It provides a, a nice suite for testing this kind of things, and during the... Um, um, DebConf, I talked to um, Zach and Colin, and Ubuntu also has a spec on automated testing, and I'd like to um, 
I'd, I'd welcome if any one of you is motivated to work in this area because I, that's the part I'd like to, to work with in the next few months. Colin? Uh, I, can just give, I can just give a little more background on that. The, um, uh, Ian Jackson did this a uh, while back and uh, he took it to DevConf actually at the time and uh, talked, to, talked to the number of people about it. Um, he's not, oper not operating it anymore. Um, I think that the main thing that this needs is for, um, it, I don't think it needs significant software development except for maybe um, you know, just fixing bit rot and things. Um, what it most needs is for somebody to simply operate it. Uh, so, you know, run the service somewhere, uh, deal with filing bugs, um, deal with yeah. things when it goes wrong. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think it's, I don't think it would be a major project for somebody to um, take on. You're not, uh, you're not having to develop vast swathes of software in order to operate auto package test. Mm -hmm. And um, a problem I've, I have with live systems is I'd like to see dpkg divert for config files. Um, several tools already support an inclusion uh, mechan mechanism for config files, so you can just use the um, package.d um, directory or just pr um, add an additional include into some config files. But there are several tools out there that doesn't support customization with um, additional config files. So I just need to replace some init scripts and that's stuff I don't want to do without letting or informing the user that I have to do it. So what I'd like to see is some kind of, of, of update alternatives or uh, divert um, um, option to replace config files for your own needs. Um, support for um, config files, um, that's what I was talking about, sorry. Um, outdated kernel or lack of essential tools and modules. Um, sometimes the kernel doesn't provide all the features that are necessary for live boot and we have to work around this. And I'd like to um, see the live projects uh, being part of the core project itself. So the kernel provides always all the features that are necessary for live systems that are essential for live systems and that um, several distributions start to, to work together because there are several patches against mainline flowing around and I'd like to see a common place so we don't have the problem that everyone has to reinvent the wheel. A very interesting uh, second approach, interesting, uh, sec, um, mentioned uh, the automated testing and exactly the, the constantly usable testing approach and that's what I was thinking of as well because um, this kind of approach gives us the option to test um, the Debian system at each single day. And I'd like to see rolling uh, releases as part of our daily uh, work on and development as Debian developers and not just um, wait two years for another stable release and tr see what might break currently in testing um, for when as soon as we want to release it. So if any one of you isn't aware of this uh, approach yet, um, please visit this this website and 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 read about it. And I'd like to see live media as release goal for Debian releases. Um, currently, we are releasing and we have a ma at maximum a, s a short notice in the release notes. But I think most people actually wait for live system or live media to check out the new Debian release and I think it should show up at the same time as we release Squeeze. So if anyone is um, interested in, in, in getting this as release goal, please let us know and um, um, tell the Debian Live people on the mailing list and let's coordinate this, this efforts towards the, the next release. Oh, um, Open Office broke up. Something interesting. <laughs> um, it should read as live system. So um, I'd like to, to, to suggest uh, Debian Derivatives, which is a new sub-project, which is an excellent idea in my opinion. And li I'd like to propose um, such a thing for Debian Derivatives Live. So all the, the teams that provide live systems, uh, more than 100 live systems are out there, 
um, can share their knowledge, can share their problems without being uh, implementation specific. Because um, I use my own build system, the Debian Live um, guys use their own build system, and I'd like to see um, other distributions share their knowledge, their problems, and where we can might or possibly work together. So, um, to repeat um, the, the, the state of, of live systems, I want to mention that we are pretty good at live systems nowadays. It was much harder when I started to work on, on live systems seven years ago. Um, it was pretty much a, a mess with dealing with um, hardware support, with building a live system, because back those days we used to take an uh, existing distribution and remaster it within a change route, um, usually manually, without being able to reproduce anything. Nowadays we have a very nice build systems. Um, we have a good amount of existing live systems for all the different tastes and, and needs. And I think we should work um, together towards a official um, live system within Debian to provide users a decent way, a nice way to, to test a new release. I'd like to um, point to two meetings. The first one is the Debian Live team meeting, which will take uh, place today evening. Please join us if you are interested in the, the, the live system part of it. And the second one is the, the cut-off session of Joy Hess. Um, everyone interested in, in attending or, or working in this area, please join tomorrow in the Interschool Lab. So, um, I think there's some time left and I'm open for questions. Yeah. <coughs> so, um, the, there are some real significant challenges and technical problems with the idea of using dpackage divert on configuration files, which is I one know. of the big reasons why we don't do it. Um, particularly well at present, and particularly the, the guarantees that you have around configuration files with a user with user modifications yeah. have real problems when you divert them. Um, so, I mean, I, from my perspective, I would actually much rather identify the places where you feel like you need to do that and fix them. Um, so, I think your biggest one is init scripts. Um, as it so happened uh, in the first talk this morning, we actually had a really great discussion about that particular topic. Um, so. To, at the risk of introducing something controversial, um, that is something Upstart would, would be able to solve for us, uh, is that Upstart will have a different mechanism for being able to override an init script that you will not need to divert it or treat it oddly um, like you have to with init scripts. So um, if we can identify the other places where you're running into places where you need to divert config files, I would rather fix them than try to figure out how to make dpackage divert on config files work. Um. I fully acknowledge your approach, but uh, I see two problems. One is um, the uncooperative maintainers or um, the lack of uh, importance for Debian itself for systems that just want to do it different. For example, I'm uh, generating SSH keys just when the user starts the, the SSH server. And the init scripts within Debian doesn't support any, any way to generate the keys on request. And it's a pretty tricky um, stuff because on hard disk installations you might operate differently. And um, that's the, the, the one, one thing about it. And the, uh, For the record, I'm happy to work with you and that. Sorry? For the record, I'm happy to work with you and that as oh, a great, maintainer. Great, great. <laughs> um, and the second, the second um, part of it is we aren't aware of all the users that are building live systems. So we might fix our own stuff, but we aren't aware of the problems that other people do. And I uh, I'm, I know ver se several live systems and looked on behind the, the scenes, and they are pr doing pretty dirty stuff to get their problems resolved. And as soon as we provide a, m a, a way how to, to resolve this issue, uh, we might fix their, their hacky stuff as well. Um, I know that um, uh, the modifications of, of config files are a problem for, for the div diversion, and I'm, um, I'm not uh, sure whether it's the best approach, really. But I think we should talk about uh, a way how to resolve this issue without fixing all the, the issues we might um, come up with in init scripts or any other uh, tools. So, I mean, I guess I would put it this way. I think that um, the places where you need to divert config files are technical bugs in packages. 
in that I believe that the, it, at the very least it would be an improvement in the quality of the package if there were some sort of override mechanism or config directory yeah. that you would not need to edit a single configuration file. And I think that maintainers who are standing in the way of improving the quality of their packages is a political problem that we can solve. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. So. Uh, Kai Hendry, I just wanted to say that there's uh, a, a set of scripts contributed by Brendan Slight in the Debian Live community, and he in that order tests some of my images, and uh, you basically he with running these scripts, you get like a video of your, your your distribution booting up in a final PNG, so you can see if the uh, ah, okay. if, if the thing worked. So um, I'm aware of this, I even tried it on my own, but it's not enough for me. I don't want to know whether it just boots because that's um, something I expect from nowadays live systems, but I'd like to write um, tests for each single software package in our pool. So software maintainers it's themselves can write as, um, their own unit tests that are executed, um, that report back, um, do I work as expected too? So um, the screenshot approach has um, solved the problem or at least partially um, solved the problem that you get a working system that boots just up, but um, I dealing with, with bugs in several tools users might not be aware um, of yet because they don't use unstable for live systems, uh, for example but that, that breaks something, and that's um, nearly on a daily basis, and I'd like to see this resolved so, so we can just um, work together and um, not anyone who um, notices a bug is hunting it and might not be aware of another one hunting it because it might be tricky to locate it even. And I'd like to report it as soon as some package uh, breaks or some software with other tools involved uh, breaks. But um, definitely worth mentioning, thanks. Hello, Anton. Hi. <laughs> am I, am I, oh, sorry. <laughs> Phil is camera, maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> to pick up on the SSH point and the diversion thing together. The problem, one of the problems with diverting config files is if the upstream, sorry, the upstream Debian developer then uh, packages a version that has a completely different uh, configuration file and puts a load of scripts in that fixes it. You've diverted it, it fixes the, uh, uh, the diverted version that you're not using and everything breaks. So that's not terribly helpful. Uh, on the SSH front, I think that points at a, a more general problem that we have, which it would be nice to have some way of saying to a system when it's booting that it's actually a new copy of the system. So that if you've cloned a disk, it works out that it needs to do something about a new system name, new IP address, new keys, a whole bunch of things, and having some extra options to, I don't know, the init script, that says you know it's clone time rather than it's start time might be a way of doing that, or it may be a, a depackage reconfigure option. Drop, that drop yeah, so so that because it is quite useful sometimes to just take a, a bit for bit copy of a system, and then on boot you have to either be a bit careful, or it would be nice to be able to say boot as a clone and sort yourself out, and that would be very similar to the booting a live system. Uh, what would be involved in uh, using a non-Linux kernel with the live CDs? So it seems to be pretty Linux specific at the moment, the process. Um, I'm, I have never tried anything, but I'm aware that the FreeBSD port might be interesting and that, that Daniel over there might have news for you. Hi. Um, if you want to port it to another kernel, you only need um, a layer, uh, UniFS or whatever. Compression is nice, but you don't need it, so 
Yeah, that's almost everything. And I'd like to make three points about what you said before. First, um, you said that Grub has that uh, fancy loop mode. Um, have a look at SysLinux, it's much nicer. You can um, use memdisk module, and then you need only two lines, uh, label whatever, um, kernel, memdisk, append, my fancy ISO, and then it boots that. Um, can, I, can I respond to that briefly? Sure. Um, the, so, yes, uh, the memdisk works, uh, I think it, I think that's, um, that's using BIOS hooks, isn't it? Yeah, and it's... Um, so that uh, works provided that your operating system <coughs> pays attention to the BIOS in any way, but um, uh, which I don't think Linux always does. Um, but you know, we'd be we'd be happy in the spirit of com of competitiveness between uh, bootloaders. We'd be happy at, to integrate that into Grub. Sure. Uh, second thing was you said that let's make live images official for the next release. We do have. Uh, official images for Lenny. And what was the third thing? Um, I don't remember. Well, I, I think it should be just the official release goal and uh, other other guys and for especially the release managers should support it, um, right? And the third thing was that <laughs> uh, the BOF later on is just a team meeting. Everyone is welcome, but it's kind of boring, I guess, if you're not really involved. Oh, so. right. So, I think no further questions. Well. Hi, my name is Alex. Um, oh. Okay, you mentioned with a package like SSH, it assumes oh, it's for... You assume that a package like SSH is for it's assuming it's installing on the hard drive. If you have a live system that's that's not really meant to use a CD, it's going all into RAM after it loads up. What assumptions change on how the live system works? Does, does much change if you just have a kiosk system? It, it swallows the it does a net boot. It swallows the makes a RAM disk and it starts running. What changes with the live setup? Um, well, for the for the live system itself, the live system already looks like a hard disk installation, so there isn't really a change. And you, if you put it into RAM, just the access to to any block blocks and on the file system are are faster. But um, for me, it's also an, an issue because I don't want to create the SSH key on each boot. It just co costs time and resources. So I don't want that. That's an approach other guys are taking. But I don't want this. And um, I don't have an, an host key by default shipped with my live system. So it's not just that it doesn't look like a live system, but I have different needs than uh, people doing hard disk installations. OK, but the question w wasn't so much specific to SSH. It's just that th the assumption for a live CD is is that it's going to access the CD if it's uh, if it's let's say looking for an SSH program or looking for Open Office. But if you have a if you if you just using RAM disk by itself, does anything change in how the live system would be designed as to a, as to if, if no. Okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm DKG. I'm uh, one of the upstreams for Deberf, which is a system that of the kind that you're describing. Um, we have packages in the in testing and unstable, um, and it's designed to just build an init RAMFS that basically looks identical to a um, a regular Debian system, um, and you can just drop that in as your RAMFS, and then tell your bootloader, "Here's the kernel. I know use this monster RAMFS instead of using whatever else," um, and then you're not relying on any block device. Um, so. I would I would be really interested in ways that the functionality of Deberf could be folded into the Debian Live process, because I think for for forensics and for system upgrades and for all kinds of other things, it's very useful. Especially with the amount of RAM that we have on machines right now, it would be very useful to have an all in it uh, all in RAM arrangement, um, just to be able to manipulate the rest of the machine without reliant being reliant on some underlying file system that you can't remove. Um, so if there's a way that we can uh, collaborate on that, yeah. I'd be ha happy to, to participate. Well, the keyword is stackable, 
and uh, I think there are already existing approaches, so we should just talk to each other. Okay, thanks. Uh, here I have a comment from IRC. Uh, uh, Martin Zobel says about Phil's comment, when you clone, you have the problem that the file system has the same UUID, so if you at any time later need to mount that uh, cloned file system into another clo cloned machine, your system gets very confused by the same UUIDs. Um, UUID of what of the live systems itself? Uh, I think that's somewhat off topic for this talk, but uh, we should have a way of dealing with that. So, Well, um, the UUIDs, you can adjust them. He's talking about the UUID on the cloned system that you have no interest in, that I mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then, thanks for flying with me, and I wish you a good dinner. Thanks. Thanks.